Good afternoon, Corey Machet. Welcome on VH Berries. Thank you, Victor. It is very nice to be here. I am immensely appreciative and grateful for this moment because you are representing a part of history alongside two of your inspiration in music and literature. I am talking about Roberta John Mitchell and Suzanne Eloise Hinton. Roberta Mitchell? <laughs> Absolutely. I was saying her full name, so maybe that it disturbed you. <laughs> I don't know who Roberta Mitchell is. I know who you're talking about with Essie Hinton, and I did not know her full name before, so that is very, very good. What is it again? Susanna Eloise? <laughs> so the first name, the real stage name is Johnny Mitchell. Oh, Johnny. Roberta? <laughs> no. Yes, J Roberta is actually Johnny and um, you have actually a very uh, important quote from her, which is that uh, your hometown is a, f a word full of people who watch the sky. Mm -hmm. Yes. I read an article that, <laughs> that jo Joni, <laughs> Joni um, had been interviewed in, and she is also from Saskatchewan, <laughs> where I'm from. And uh, yeah, she, one of, one of my takeaways from reading that article, she's a, She's a hero of mine, is that she said Saskatchewan is full of people who watch the sky. And I related to that. Absolutely. Corey Mitchell, in definitive, we cannot really say that it was one of your inspiration, but uh, I really enjoy that quote uh, related uh, to your hometown. This is why I included it. But how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good. I'm in Vancouver, you know, um, it's a little gray here today, which I'm, you know, not such a fan of, but uh, I miss the Saskatchewan sunshine and the California sunshine. But besides that, it's good. I, I heard a, I heard a young uh, eagle this morning, which I thought was a good sign. You miss the global view of the sunset and I would love to have the global view of your adventure, Cory Machet, because you have experienced the advent of digital cameras in the late 90s to film a variety of narrative formats and genres in definitive, this is undue hard work, not to confuse with undue influence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. I would love to discuss about um, how it got all started, because one of your very first feature film and projects you worked on is called Undue Influence. I know, I can't believe you just said that. You know, it's so funny because I was like, is that the film I did? That was with Brian Dennehy, I believe, a long time ago. So wow, you have done your research, my friend. Um, yeah, you know, I, I have done so many projects that I literally forget the names and even people will say what about that scene that you were in and i just saw that movie and i'm like uh i don't remember that so um anyway yes undue influence was a very very long time ago and that was close to the beginnings of when i started getting some traction in in the film world which which was uh after i had long after I had decided to be an actor and um, gone to theater school 
Um, I, uh, I wanted to be an actor. I decided to be an actor when I was 12. And the reason I, it hit me was that I was obsessed with Essie Hinton's novel. (laughs) 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 And, uh, and then I had this, yeah, I had this addiction, addiction to the way her, her characters and what they were going through and the way she wrote them, what they made me feel. I felt deeply their plights and the story. And probably on about the 10th read, I picked up a teen beat magazine in the eighties and, um, there was an article about the fact that Francis Ford Coppola was going to be making a film about the outsiders, of the outsiders, and it listed the cast, and I read that, and there was literally a, a light bulb moment in my life. It was just like this bing, this light went off in my whole being, and I knew that I had to, wanted to be, must be an actress. And I came out of my room and announced it to my family and I've never looked back. And uh, and then that's taken me on this incredible journey and I'm still at it, you know, many, 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 many years later and I still love it many, many years later. I feel like the, the, the process of being an actress, you know, one of the things I've learned is that process is is probably as important as the acting itself. It's been like a, it's just a, a life's journey when you decide that you're going to do something like that. It just takes you on this <laughs> its own its own path. Amazing, uh, complicated, and uh, totally exciting path. This life tornado, Corey Matchett. As, as you just mentioned, started um, at a very young age with that book that you read more than a dozen times called The Outsiders by the author S.E. Hinton. <laughs> and um, this is actually a young adult novel, which is set in Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful book. Um, I don't know if schools require students to read it anymore, but it was required reading for a long time. Um, (laughs) But I actually read it before I had to read it in school. I I don't know how I found out about it, but yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Absolutely, Corey Machette. And to come back to this very uh, first project called Undue Influence. You were playing the character of Morsi Reed and going down the stairs wearing a white shirt with a handbag on the right shoulder. Uh, I watched it and uh, between (laughs) the two scenes in which you played in, there were around 20 minutes apart. And I think that it was recorded on the same day uh, with the only difference of attaching your hair on the second sequences. (laughs) That's amazing. I mean, I don't even know. I think I saw it once, probably when it aired on whatever network it was airing on, CBS or whatever. And that's amazing. You know more about it than I do, Victor. Absolutely. Since the very beginning, you were always portraying character with uh, power and a lot of responsibility. And I would love to discuss about one other event that happened very recently related to theater and your work on the stage. Can you tell us a little bit more about it, about the wedding party? Oh, I would love to. Yes, actually just this past weekend, a week ago today, I arrived in Montreal and I met 
my theater school class who graduated 30 years ago this year. can't believe it. And we've talked about getting together for a reunion uh, and also with the notion of the potential of doing some kind of a performance on the, the Monument National stage, which is the, the main stage for the National Theater School, that our class did not have the opportunity to perform on because it was being refurbished in the years 1992, 1993, which was our final year in theater school. So we were the only class that did not get the opportunity to perform on it. So actually Patrick Gallagher, who is a classmate of, of mine, had this idea and he's had it for years that we should all get together and do a performance. And we all kind of went, that's how can we do that? We're all so busy and in different parts of the world. But finally, it somehow came together and we decided that we were going to do a staged reading of one of our classmates' uh, play, Kristen Thompson's play called The Wedding Party. And so we just did that um, this last weekend. And so my uh, nine of my classmates and myself met. And, uh, those classmates uh, include Patrick Gallagher, as I said, Sandra O, oh, Kristen Thompson, uh, Andrew Tarbett, People came from all over the world to gather in Montreal to do this reading. And we got together and had this amazing project to work on. And then we um, performed on the stage of the Monument National. <laughs> and we also, um, we, we wanted to give that money to, to, uh, to a fund called the um, indigenous uh, advisory circle and um, that is to help bring indigenous and first nation teachings into the theater school so it was for a good cause as well and uh, we had an amazing time just getting on the stage flying by the seat of our pants uh, doing this very funny reading funny for more reasons than one we <laughs> It made a lot of mistakes, but we enjoyed every second of it, and uh, it was a great play, and we had a great time, and it was amazing to uh, be reunited with my amazing classmates doing what we love. And I think it reminded us all why we love doing it. You know, we uh, it was interesting to me because we rehearsed we rehearsed the play. Uh, a number of times, you know, not as many as we would have liked probably, but we did it, uh, you know, so we were very familiar with it. We rehearsed how we were going to get on the stage. We rehearsed how we were going to get off the stage. But what was interesting to me is the thing that we did not rehearse or did not discuss was what we were going to do when the applause came. We hadn't even thought about that. And so when the applause came, I think we all kind of looked shocked. In a, at each other, but, oh no, oh, we, are, we have to do like, a, we have to bow. And, and there was a lot of confusion on how we were going to do that. And I, what amazed me and sort of thrilled me about that was the reason we got together to do this was not because we were looking for applause. We did it because we love it. We love the process. We love the idea. We just loved hanging out together. We weren't thinking about the applause. So the applause at the end was like a, a bonus and we were fumbled around <laughs> like we didn't know what we were doing at that point but um yeah it was it was great and it was sort of a it was a great full circle moment and also i think a, a reinvigoration uh for all of us to remind us how lucky we are to be doing this and and also how much we love it i, I love what i do so much it's it's an incredible thing to to be able to do it, to make a living at it is it's like a miracle. This is such a miracle and this is beautiful that people came all across the world to witness Carrie Machette finally connecting the dots <laughs> 30 years after. Yeah, yeah, it was intense. <laughs> and uh, Corey Machet, can you tell us a little bit more about this specific trip? Because you did some 
rehearsal, you did the performances, but also a lot of visits uh, three decades after and also some very deep conversation with current students and other alumni. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, you know, it was amazing. Um, we flew in on the Friday and on Saturday, we it was scheduled that we were going to be speaking with the students after we had some rehearsal time at the school. And a lot of us, most of us, hadn't even walked into the school for 30 years. So we all walked down St. Denis together to the theater school and um, it was like our 30, year, 30 years ha had sort of just shrunk into, into like the present moment. It was like the past self was meeting the future self and the future self was meeting the past self and it was very trippy. And, and so there was all of that energy and then the rehearsal energy going into sitting down and talking with the students. So we talked with the, the, the students who were coming from the acting programs and in the English uh, uh, division and also in the French side and Francophone side. And, and, and so we were given this incredible opportunity to not only answer their questions, but to, to tell them things that I think all of us wish that we had told ourselves at that time 30 years ago when we were about to graduate or when we were in second year going into third year or when we were in first year going into second year and it was it really was a full circle moment of feeling like we have 30 years later we have something to say <laughs> and we have learned a lot and if we can we 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 all had this need to share what we felt would have served us to know at that time and you know it's interesting one of the main takeaways was you think you're on this timeline you know you think the minute you have to graduate out of theater school or you know, finish whatever you're at, that you've got to then make it. It's all got to come together and you've got to, you know, it's got to all happen. But there are so many people who have been on different timelines. Like some people had a sort of instant success and have kept going. Some people have been sort of up and down. Some people didn't stop being, having a Joe job until they were 40 years old. And, and some people still have to have a uh, a Joe job. Some people have transitioned into being writers in television, and some people have transitioned to being playwrights as well. Some people do it all. There's students, and and what the the general consensus was is it is a journey, and and the best thing you could do for yourself is be compassionate with yourself on this journey. Be gentle with yourself on this journey, and don't give up if you want to be an actor and there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows and you can't know everything going out of theater school and what you're learning in theater school might not even drop in until 10 years later 20 years later 30 years later you know and um i it i think it was also as i said before a reset for all of us because these are all the things as we learn that we have to practice we have to practice not being impatient. We have to practice <laughs> <laughs> kindness and compassion. We have to practice being good. Every single time we step out there, everybody, everybody does. Everybody does. And Corey Machet, I am really enjoying the word that you just said, timeline, because uh, in this school, there are different uh, timelines under one place at 5,030 Saint-Denis Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Lots of different timelines converging in one spot. And Corey Matchett, by asking yourself a lot of questions during and after this visit, there is also this idea that you always love to think about 
of giving back. And I feel that this is something important for you, not only with the play that was connected to the indigenous adv advisory circle, but also uh, about yourself and how you can help and give back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at this point in my life, I am talking with with friends and colleagues who are at the sort of same point that the, that I'm at in life. And there is a point, uh, and it comes sooner or later, I think, where where there's a feeling of wanting to give, give. We have, you know, the, the knowledge grows and, and <clears throat> life continues and, and what evolves is, and what is evolving for me is this feeling of how, how can I give back? How, how can I give, how can I, what, how can I make the world a better place? doing what I, <laughs> what I love, you know? I, and I don't know the answer to that just yet, but I, I am putting it out there and I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for clarity on that, you know? Because <laughs> I think it's possible. I think that we're all here to, you know, a, a very dear friend of mine says, you know, her prayer to the universe every day is, um, show me how to give It back in a way that's bigger than than myself and I think that's a great prayer or a mantra to set to put out there you know show me let me let me do that and then let me have the courage and and the stamina to do that you know this this uh, this crazy job of being an actor takes incredible courage and stamina um, stubbornness stick to itiveness. but there does come a point in your life where you know it it, it it makes sense to to make it be about more than just you and I, I am definitely at that point so so we'll see what that means but um, I'm this weekend helped uh, help launch that idea in an even even bigger way because doing what we love and giving back to the indigenous advisory circle even in a smallish way felt right and good and you know maybe maybe acting can do some good in the world in a bigger way absolutely Corey Machette acting can also give a lot and one thing that is impossible to give back is probably an increase of population in the small town of Spalding <laughs> because it has decreased from 500 a few decades ago to exactly 244 inhabitants right now that's amazing you did your research that's incredible <laughs> yeah yeah i'm from this little little town in the middle of the prairies which is still my favorite place in the world and uh, when i was born there they had a hospital there then they don't now but there was 500 people booming metropolis of 500 people and now it's only a 244 people and uh, <laughs> I was so proud and happy to be from that place you know like when I remember my my son and I went there a few years ago and I hadn't been there for a few years and it is you know it's two hours away from from Saskatoon and two hours away from Regina it's far far away from a city and it's on its own on the prairie and I remember when we got there I had the first night we were there it was so quiet and you know there's not that many people who live in the town anymore and I remember I had this feeling of like oh, are we gonna be okay we're really out there <laughs> we're really out there and you know it took a few days but my whole nervous system calmed down after being there for a few days with the calm and the quiet and the space and the sky and that's when i was reminded of joni mitchell's quote of saskatchewan is full of people who watch the sky 
<laughs> and you know, when I need to be calm and when I need to take a breath or if I feel like I'm getting wound up about something, I just imagine that prairie landscape and I imagine that sky and I imagine all of that space around me and it calms me down and gives room for my imagination and whenever I feel like also that I am limiting myself on some level I think about that landscape and I think about that sky and how it is limited, limitless in its potential and it fills me up Indeed, Corey Machet, imagination is something very important to cultivate and grow every day, which is the case concerning the script of one of your uh, very uh, recent projects uh, called The Night Agent, in which you're playing the character of the president of the uh, United States, Michelle Travers. Can you tell us a little bit more about this extraordinary television series? Well, you know, when I read the, the <laughs> pilot script of, of The Night Agent and, um, and then I read for the president, I was obsessed with getting the part. First of all, the script is, it was an incredible read. Um, it, I didn't want to put it down reading it, which, you know, that doesn't happen very often. And, and then I think the, the television series really, um, honors that energy in that you can't turn it off. And, The idea of playing the president of the United States was like, I mean, so exciting to me. And I, I was actually at a friend's wedding in Puerto Rico when I was asked to audition for it. And um, so I didn't have that much time to put myself on tape and I had to put my, you know, I had to, to take a night away and learn the lines and then my friend did not help me Put my put me on tape before you know 20 minutes before the wedding and so i quickly put myself on tape for it in my hotel room and sent it off but i had this feeling <laughs> and, you know and you just kind of go oh i hope that was okay and but i mean what else could you do i was in puerto rico but i had this feeling of i have to play this part and then interestingly enough being in puerto rico which i'd never been in before i i, I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of puerto ricans about Puerto Rico and, and their reality under the U.S. umbrella. And that was absolutely fascinating. And I remember feeling like if I ever become president of the United States, I am going to change the situation for Puerto Rico. And so, of course, being on a television show and playing the president of the United States, I don't quite have that power. But in my imagination, I do. <laughs> I did. And then when I found out about a week and a half later that I got the part, I feel like I just ran with it in my own mind. And then the entire time I researched uh, Lincoln, I researched Obama, I read their writings, and I just lived in this space for the entire time we were shooting it of being the president of the United States, what that would feel like, um, the responsibility that, One, one holds being the president of the United States. And even though I wasn't in every single scene, the, there was a whole life that I wove between the, the scenes I was in. And um, it was really exciting to, to step <laughs> into those shoes and pretend to be that person. I, I loved every second of it. And I'm so pleased that the, the, the show is a success and is a, it's a it's it's manifestation is as good or better than the scripts were because they were very good and i was just so thrilled also to be the female president you know the world is ready for that and 
I'm thrilled even if only on the imaginatory level that I could put that impression out, I can help put that impression out to the world that hey, this could be a good thing. We should think about doing this because it could be a very, very good thing to have a woman as president. The world is ready for it, Cory Matchett. And how would you describe President uh, Trevor's temperament and personality? Whip smart, driven, of course, but driven by good, a real intention to do good in the world, to make changes that serve the world's good. A compassionate president. I know I we, we didn't explore it in the scripts, but I decided that I have a husband and children. And so being a mother in that position as well, I feel like and being in the one of the great seats of power in the world, I felt is my responsibility to do good with my power. Help make the world a better place. Not worse. Not to enlist any more damage in the world, but to try to actually create more peace and compassion. Absolutely, Corey Matchett. And I assume that um, and when I saw those scenes uh, as a president, uh, you have to stay uh, very professional and very serious all the time. But I assume that behind the scene during the recording, you had a lot of fun. Do you have Uh, very special memories about uh, those weeks and months of recording? You know, one of the things that I remember is uh, when we were shooting the last episode and there's, you know, numerous times where Gabe comes out of nowhere where, where I'm about to get in the helicopter. He comes out of nowhere and then grabs me and like pulls me down. We had to do that. I can't even tell you how many times we had to do that. And the, the field that we had to run through, it had been raining. It was just shot in Vancouver. It had been raining and raining and raining. So it was like, and people's shoes would get stuck in the mud. So you're trying to run and like a shoe flips off or it gets stuck in the mud or whatever. And then, and so we all laughed and tried to just remain somewhat graceful and able to like run through the the field in that like mucky mud that kept holding our shoes. But Gabe and I had to, you know, we'd, after the after the explosion, we would have to like be on the ground and, and get back up. And every time we have to get on the ground, we would just laugh and laugh and laugh at how absurd it was that we're literally like in the mud and he's grabbing me over and over and over again. And <laughs> it was so physical. I don't know, for some reason he and I just laughed and laughed and laughed at how absurd the whole thing was. Because it really, you know, at the end of the day, we're all just playing. Right, we're playing at that. It's you know our imaginations take us to that place where we are those people. But then you're actually just a bunch of kids playing in the mud, you know, playing in the mud. <laughs> And I think that uh, in season two, uh, maybe that um, we could have something in. President Travers uh, Library, maybe a copy of The Outsiders, or maybe a copy of Teen Beats magazines. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can make that happen, Victor. And if you see it, you'll know that that's an ode to you. <laughs> I am definitely looking forward to see the season two and uh, the next chapter of uh, The Night Agent because uh, this is a fantastic television series. Thank you very much, Corey Machette. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.